to get this show on the road. So my name is Chris Sobe. I work at Shopify. Snook actually hired me, for which I was very thankful. Um, and working at Shopify gave me the ability to work on a platform where we're a little bit more restrictive in terms of what browsers we support. And that meant that for about a year and a half now, we've been able to go Flexbox only for all of our layouts. So not a float in sight for a year and a half, which is uh, pretty awesome. And what that's allowed us to do is uh, kind of find where it's strong, find where it's weak, and find where it can really help in uh, responsive, dynamic, very large applications, which is what Shopify is. Um, so this talk is about Flexbox, and it's about what I'm going to call content-driven layouts with Flexbox, but it's really about uh, responsive layouts. And responsive in the truest sense of the word, where we're going to look at responding to the size of content and the size of the parent and the size of the siblings uh, being much more responsive than you've ever seen with any media query. So before we start, we're going to look at what some alternative ways to lay out a page or lay out a component are. Uh, so what strategies have we used in the past? What are you folks still using today? Um, one that might come to mind, absolute positioning. For folks who are good with Photoshop, this probably feels uh, pretty comfortable. Uh, you come in, you treat the web page as a fixed canvas, you position your elements exactly in the X and Y space, and you, maybe you specify their heights and their widths as well. Um, and this is great. You feel super in control. You feel like you're the boss. Uh, until someone resizes their browser even just a tiny little bit, or that piece of text you thought was going to be two lines ends up actually being three lines. And all of a sudden, your absolute layout completely breaks. And larger than that, we've kind of got this issue where the container needs to know everything about the children. It needs to know their exact sizes, their exact positions, because it is doing this top-down layout. It's saying, you are positioned here, you are positioned here for every single child within it. It doesn't give the children any way of manipulating the layout based on dynamic or variable content. Another thing we might come up with, inline block. This does, in some ways at least, um, respect dynamic content inside of the children. Unfortunately, for anyone who's done inline blocks, hopefully you know that picture represents that there's this damn like three or four pixels of spacing between inline block elements. And you can try and get rid of it with like font size zero on the container and then reset it inside the children. Uh, or you can actually manipulate your HTML so that there's no white space between the elements. But hopefully doing something like that makes you feel pretty gross. And you can see that this is really not designed for complex layouts either. Even though it has some nice features, still not that great. And even worse, things that should be incredibly simple, like vertical centering or equal height columns, basically impossible if we're using inline blocks. So not a great choice either. How about floats? How many people are still using floats for the majority of their layouts? Yeah, so I think a fair number of people. Um, we've made them work. <laughs> It's about the best you can say for floats, to be honest. Uh, um, try teaching a beginner what the hell a float is and why, oh, you floated uh, all of your children, so now all of a sudden your boxes collapse, sorry. Uh, or what the heck a clear fix is. Um, floats are really not super great for layouts. They're the best we had, so we made them work. Um, but they have a lot of the exact same problems. Things that should be simple and are incredibly simple in layout problems, like vertical centering, like equal height columns, uh, very tricky to do. We have to have lots of hacks in order to make them work with floats. And we still have this very top-down prescriptive layout where the parent has to say the widths of the floated children so that they don't collide with one another. Uh, and screw up the entire layout. So how do we solve this? Well, spoiler alert, Flexbox is going to be the answer. So let's talk about Flexbox. Um, but the reason that Flexbox is the answer to this is because it really comes at this completely differently from all the other layout techniques that we've listed. Um, it really does this inversion of control where instead of the parent prescriptively saying top down, this is where you are and this is your size, 
uh, the children now have all of the control initially in the layout. So the children say, this is how wide I naturally am, and this is how I want to grow and shrink to fill space that's available. And only then does the parent come into play and says, okay, based on what size my children want it to be, I'm going to do a couple of alignment things on top of that. So it's this real inversion of control, and that's why I'll call it content out or content driven layouts because it's the content that determines how it's laid out based on its relationship with its siblings and with its parent container. And before we get too, too excited, I uh, always want to bring up browser support if you're talking about a new-ish uh, CSS feature. Um, there's good and bad news on this front, I guess. It really depends uh, about where you work. Uh, supported in all the major browsers, including even Opera Mini. But of course, there's that first icon, shocker. Um, <laughs> IE10 only. Uh, and even in IE10, they really uh, screwed the pooch on that one. They, they, did not, they did not do the best implementation of Flexbox. Um, so it really depends on your individual circumstances, whether this is something that can work for you. There are ways to progressively enhance up from a float-based layout to a, a flexbox layout. There aren't any good polyfills, and even if you could, it would be such an expensive polyfill that it probably wouldn't be worth it. In my opinion, uh, and in the opinion of most people at Shopify, I think, um, it's just such a pain to actually do the progressive enhancement that it's probably fine to leave IE9, IE8, I hope that's the lowest anyone has to support. Um, <laughs> leave those users with just a linear layout, just the like default DOM layout, and then the Flexbox uh, comes in at IE10 and takes care of doing the columns and whatever other layout concerns that you're dealing with. Overall, though, oops, uh, can I use? And I love every time I do this talk, I get to update this number. It gets higher and higher, and now it's over 95%. So it's pretty hard to argue with 95%. And even of that, um, I think there's, uh, it's something like 90% of that is the prefix free, most recent version of the spec. So really great support. I think most people can use this today or should have been using it for a while now. It's pretty well supported. So how do we actually use Flexbox? There's two parts to the spec. Um, there's the rules that apply to the parent container and then there's rules that apply to the individual children within that container. I'm going to start with the parent rules first. To kick off Flexbox, all we need to do is set display of flex on the container. And you can't really see that super well. Sorry about that, the comment. Um, there's also an inline flex version, uh, which will still do the same Flexbox layout algorithm, but will be in line with other inline content. Then there's a second property, the default for it is row, which is the flex direction. And this is just, broadly speaking, what way do the children flow? So by default, flex direction row, they're going to flow horizontally, which is what we want to do in probably most layouts. Um, but there's also the column version, which allows you to lay them out vertically. Pretty obvious from looking at it. This has implications for all the other properties because the axis that becomes the main axis completely changes. Uh, I'm going to be using most of my examples as if we have a row flex container, um, but you can do both. And there are actually two other properties, which are row reverse and column reverse, that I'm not going to get into too much because I don't think they're. Uh, I think they have some problems, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but just to let you know, it's not, I'm not giving an encompassing view of the spec. There are a couple other properties. Uh, so in addition to the basic properties to set off our flex containers, we can also determine how they're going to align themselves along both the main and what we call the cross axis. So in order to uh, align items along the main axis, which if you have a row flex container is the horizontal axis, um, we use the justify content property. And the property names are kind of, they're not great. They all sound really different. It's not clear that they belong to the same spec, but the actual properties are pretty self-explanatory. Um, justify content center will make it so that along the main axis, so by default the horizontal one, all of the children are centered. If they're not big enough to take up the whole container, they'll be centered within it. It's not too exciting. We've been able to do this with margin for a while, but it's nice that we have it. 
We can also pin them to the leading edge of the container with flex start, pin them to the trailing edge of the container with flex end. We can do cool things like do space between, which will automatically calculate uh, what the equal size gutter is between every set of elements and then put that in there. So that's pretty handy. Uh, and a similar one, space around, which will have the same space between each set of elements and between the leading edge in the first element and the trailing edge in the last element. So pretty nice, pretty much anything you could hope for along the main axis. The slightly more exciting part is along the cross axis. We use um, align items to determine how we're going to align or stretch items along that secondary axis. So again, if you have a row flex container, the cross axis is the one that goes perpendicular to your main one. Uh, so in the case of row, it's the vertical axis. The default for align items is stretch. And boom, just like that, you can see we have something that's so unbelievably complicated to do in any other layout technique, equal height columns. That's the default property. And they're just gonna stretch to be as tall as the tallest child. We can also do a line item center. And boom, another one, vertical centering. Who would have thought that this would be like a two decade struggle to get? <laughs> but there it is, a line item center. Uh, regardless of what the heights of the individual children are, uh, they're gonna be centered within the container. We can also do flex start to pin them to the leading edge, flex end to pin them to the trailing edge. Pretty natural, pretty easy to understand. Um, I have a reference at the end if you have trouble remembering these properties, which I often do as well, but they're pretty self-explanatory when you see them in code. In addition to this, we have another property that's, I think, really misunderstood and really underused, which is flex wrap. The default for this is no wrap, which means that if we have a set of children whose cumulative size is greater than the parent, and we're not allowing them to shrink, I'll talk about how we determine that in a second, um, by default, they'll just overflow the container. But if we set them to be flex wrap, then they go onto separate lines, just like text would wrap onto separate lines. The really interesting part here, though, is that each of those lines becomes its own flex container. So all of the calculations, all of the alignment and stretching and distribution rules that we're talking about, those calculations are done individually on each and every single line, which allows us to do really interesting things where when uh, a particular element breaks down onto a new line, we can actually change its entire alignment based on the properties that we supplied it because now it's in a different flex container all on its own. And we'll show some examples of that later on. That's it for parent rules. Uh, child rules. So only three of these guys, and they are hopefully pretty self-explanatory, but we're gonna go over them anyway. Flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis, commonly combined into the single flex shorthand property, which is grow, shrink, and basis. I'll talk about flex basis first. I think it's probably the most confusing one. Flex basis allows you to set what the starting point size for a particular element is. So by default, we have flex spaces of auto, which means in a flex container that the starting width for the element is going to be the exact size of its contents. So if you have a little bit of text, the default size for a flex item inside a flex container is the exact size of its contents. And this is where the content out layout really starts to come out. But we can manually specify a different starting width from which we'll do the grow and shrink calculations afterwards. And we can do that with the flex basis property. So this, the flex basis property is effectively equivalent to setting flex basis of auto, which is the default, and just manually specifying a width for the element. Now, for flex grow and flex shrink, I think it's helpful to see a bit of a diagram, bit of an example here. Uh, in this particular example, we've got three children. Their starting point width their intrinsic size is 20 pixels. And how was that come to? Maybe that was the size of the content that was inside of them. Maybe we manually set a flex basis of 20 pixels, or we may have left the flex basis as auto and set the width to 20 pixels. Lots of different ways that that could be the starting width, but somehow they got there. And they're in a container that has 100 pixels of space available to it. If we leave, uh, so in total, just 
for, let's do some math, uh, we have 40 pixels of growth that's available to these items. Now, if we leave flex grow at the default of zero for all of the elements, none of them will stretch to fill that space. And instead, we go up to the justify content property of the parent to determine how they should be aligned. So this is where that space between or space around or flex start, um, that's where those properties start to come in only when the size of the elements in total is less than the size of the parent. However, as soon as an item has a flex grow value greater than zero, it will fill as much space as it can. It's really greedy. It'll take up as much as it can. If only one of them has a flex grow of one, it'll take up all the extra space. So justify content won't do anything in that case. But let's say that we have all three children with the same flex grow value. Um, because they all have the same value, they will share proportionately in the total amount of growth that was available. So in this case, there was 40 pixels of growth. Each one will take up roughly 13 and a third uh, pixels of growth, and that gets added to its intrinsic size of 20 to come up with its final total size. We can also have some elements with different flex grow values than others. In this example, the middle one has a flex grow of two. Now, the common misconception is that since it has a flex grow of two and the others have a flex grow of one, that it's gonna be twice as wide as the other two. But it's not the width exactly that's determined by flex grow, it's the proportion of the total growth that's consumed by that element. So it becomes a bit of a math problem. We just divide the total growth by the sum of all of the flex grows of all the children in the container. So in this case, that was 40 pixels divided by four, which is the sum of the flex grows, uh, means that for every one unit of flex grow, we're gonna get 10 pixels of growth. And then we just multiply that out by each of the children to determine how much of that growth they actually get. You can also have some that have a flex grow value uh, and some that have a zero flex grow value. And that just means the one with zero are not gonna grow at all. They'll stay their natural size. Flex shrink works in an incredibly similar way, just kind of on the reverse side. So in this case, we have a container whose width is 40 pixels, still have the three children whose widths are 20 pixels. Uh, so there's 20 pixels of shrinking that actually needs to happen here. If we have flex shrink of zero for them, which is the default, then none of them will shrink. And if there's no flex wrapping that's allowed, they're just gonna overflow their container. As soon as we start to set non-zero flex shrink values, uh, they're gonna shrink down to fill into whatever space was available. So in this case, the second and third both had a flex shrink of one. They shared proportionately in the amount of shrinking that needed to happen, um, and they'll go down by 10 pixels. Obviously, they can't go below zero, and this will still respect your min width uh, if you specify a min width for the elements. So that's it for the properties, uh, or the most important properties anyway. Uh, so hopefully you're saying, man, this Flexbox thing, not as bad as I thought, actually super cool, I'm ready to play with it. Um, just so that we're all above board here, it's not a perfect, pro it's, it's not perfect by any means. Uh, no silver bullets. Um, what are some of the problems with Flexbox? One that's, uh, that doesn't come up a ton, but that does come up is that because of this greediness of the flex grow values, if your content is streaming in, not all the content comes into the DOM at once, Flexbox will do the layout calculation and it'll figure out how much space is needed based on the children that are actually there. And then if more children get added, it'll redo that calculation. So where could this come in? Well, let's say you had a sidebar and content that both had flex grow values greater than zero. Uh, and then your sidebar comes into the DOM before the content comes in. Well, Flexbox looks at what's there when the sidebar comes in and it says, okay, sidebar, you're the only thing here. You have a non-zero flex grow value, so I'm gonna give you all the space. So that's what you asked for. And then the content comes in and it says, oh wait, actually here's another child, let's redo the calculation. And then you end up in the layout that you actually wanted. But if you have this streaming in, you might see this layout jumping around a little bit because the calculation was done multiple times as new children were added. 
Um, you can also get into some scenarios where uh, because of the way Flexbox works, you often have to do a double pass. So you have to go through, measure all of the elements, and then go through and write the widths or the heights for all those elements. Um, so double pass layouts aren't great because you know, it's twice as much work as only going over once. Um, we haven't seen any problems with that at Shopify and we, as I said, use Flexbox for pretty much every single component we have. So take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But uh, yeah, those are some of the issues that we've come up with. All right, I'm gonna do the most dangerous thing in conference talks, which is to do live demos. <laughs> These are all available as code pens. Uh, the first thing that we wanna do, I'm just gonna do it here, um, is this one's gonna be really easy, but it's gonna hopefully be pretty cool too. Uh, some basic page layout stuff. So. Code pen's there, I'll post the slides at some point. My code pen is uh, Lemon Made, L-E-M-O-N-M-A-D-E. -E. So you can see the code pens that I'm working on if you have your computer. Basically what we wanna do with this one is the really common layout where we have a fixed header and a fixed footer that we want at the bottom, and then the sidebar and the content are gonna fill any space that's in between. So hopefully everyone has built something kind of similar to this. Um, it's not super hard to do with other layout mechanisms, but it's super easy to do with Flexbox. So let's do it with Flexbox. Um, I've got a couple of basic styles here in our Flexbox. Let me make this bigger. So I've got a couple of basic styles just to set things up. Um, and before you start working with Flexbox, it's good to think, okay, what are the Flex containers and what are the elements inside of those, and how should they stretch, and which way are they gonna be stretching? So if I look at the HTML just really quickly, the page is super, super easy to, to grok. Uh, just a top level page, got our page header, which is the red part, page content, which is the middle, which contains both the sidebar and the main area, and then we've got the page footer. So what do we want to have happen? Well, what we want is uh, that middle part, the one that has the sidebar in the main area, we want it to fill the space vertically, all the space that's available. Um, and we want everything to be oriented vertically initially, so uh, hopefully the properties are starting to make sense where what that means is that the page I'm just gonna uncomment because I didn't want to actually type things. Um, what that means here is that we need the page, that was the top level container to be display flex, and we need its direction to be column because we're gonna be stretching these things out vertically. So we set flex direction column. I also sent a min width of 100 VH here so that if the size of all these guys is less than the size of the viewport, uh, we have a minimum height of the viewport uh, so that everything will go directly to the bottom. And then we just start saying, okay, how do the individual elements inside of here actually stretch or shrink in order to fit what I want? So for the header and the footer, I don't want them to grow or shrink at all. I just want them to stay their natural size. So don't want them to grow, flex grow zero. Don't want them to shrink, flex shrink zero. Want them to stay their natural size that's represented by flex basis auto. So their property is flex zero, zero, auto. And again, it's flex grow, shrink, basis for the shorthand. On the other hand, for the content, I want it to grow if there is space. So flex grow, I'll just set it to one, because I don't really care about relative proportions here. I just want it to grow if it can. Uh, and I want it to start its natural size. I don't want it to get like too small or anything. So just start at my natural size and grow if I can. So flex one, zero, auto. So this is pretty good. Um, but within the content area, uh, I want this main part to fill any space that's available. And again, we're gonna go at this from like a mobile first approach to begin with. So what that means, oops. What that means is that this main content area here, or sorry, this overall content area that has the sidebar and the main, um, I'm gonna want it to also be a flex container. So we can nest flex containers inside of each other. Uh, again, I want it to stretch things out vertically, and I just want the sidebar to stay at its exact size and the content to fill any space. So again, the properties are super duper similar to what we had before. The page content now is also a flex container and its flex direction is column because I'm 
stretching vertically. Uh, the sidebar, again, we don't want it to grow or shrink, just stay its natural size, so flex zero, zero, auto. And the main part, the blue area, we're gonna say you can grow if there's space. So flex grow of one. Now, this is one of the properties I didn't want to talk about earlier because I think it's kind of questionable in terms of how you use it. Um, we can specify that we want the layout to be the reverse of what it would normally be. So the problems with this are that the source order is still the same. So if you're tabbing through this layout, you'll always hit the sidebar first, regardless of where you put it with Flexbox. So you can get into kind of confusing scenarios where you put the sidebar below the content, and, but the tab order goes to the sidebar first and then back up to the content. It's not really great, but it makes for a cool demo. So instead of doing flex direction column, I can say flex direction column reverse. And now, instead of going like top to bottom uh, in terms of, or instead of going first, then second, then third, uh, it'll go third, second, first in terms of, or sorry, third, second, first in terms of how it actually laid the elements out. So the content appeared second in the source, but we, because we're doing reverse, uh, it appears first visually. Now, if I want this to actually work a little bit better on uh, some larger displays, I don't want the middle area to always be um, flex direction column, I want it to go to row so that I can put my sidebar and my content area beside each other at some point. So let's just write a little media query. This is the only time you'll see a media query in this presentation that just says after a certain width, instead of the page content being flex direction column or flex direction column reverse, let's just do flex direction row. So now we're gonna be spreading them horizontally. And because the default align items is to stretch the children to fill their container, we didn't even have to do anything special. The sidebar and the content just grew to fill the space that was available to them. So really easy, this breaks down incredibly well onto smaller displays. Uh, only a single media query. Everything is respecting the natural height of the elements. So I didn't have to hard code any absolute positioning to make sure that the content was below the header. Uh, if the header changes sizes, if we add something, if we change the font size of the header, then everything else will just adjust accordingly because there's no fixed measurements. Pretty good, right? Not too bad. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, but that's the boring part. That was like everyone's first Flexbox demo is let's do like holy grail layout. I want to show you guys something more interesting. So um, let's talk about popovers. We use popovers in the Shopify admin uh, a fair bit. Um, and we actually have really smart popovers which position themselves uh, and size themselves so that they're never off the screen. So the JavaScript side of the popovers looks at how much space is available around whatever activated the popover, and then just sizes the popover so that it doesn't go outside of those bounds. Um, but that's not part of this. The part of it that uh, we want to actually look at in CSS is that we have different things inside of those popovers. Sometimes we have fixed things that we want to make sure are always visible inside of the popover, like pagination buttons. It's not great to have pagination inside of a popover, but we do. Uh, um, or headers or anything. There could be a lot of different things that we might be, want to be fixed to the top of that popover. And then we want stuff below that as well, um, but we don't want it to overflow, obviously, because the popovers are restricted in their size. So if there's too much content for a particular popover, uh, we want it to be able to scroll those extra areas. So maybe you're thinking, how would I do this in JavaScript? You're like starting to rack your brain. Um, but we can do all this in CSS with Flexbox. So let's look at our second example here, popover. Um, so the HTML for this guy, again, it's not too, too bad. Uh, we've got a popover on the outside, uh, which is where the JavaScript would specify the maximum height. We have popover content inside of that, which will actually do the vertical orientation. Uh, and then we have panes, popover panes, for each set of content that's inside of that popover. So in this case, I have a popover pane and I have a, a BEM style variation of popover pane fixed, uh, which just means that I don't want it to scroll. If, uh, if the popover is too big, I want this one to always be visible. And then I've got a regular uh, popover pane here as well, which is gonna be really long, which if it has to, I'm totally fine with it scrolling. So that's the markup, pretty simple. Um, first step, if you can see here, uh, the popover, its maximum height has been set by JavaScript and it's here. 
So you, you can't really see the shadow, but the shadow stops here because that's how tall the popover is. So my first step is I want to make sure that the content doesn't overflow the popover. Um, how do we do that? Well, on the popover, I can just say display flex. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be exactly the size of the popover that's there. And why did that work? Because the popover content node, which contained all of the actual content, it's now a flex child. Um, it's the only child. It's going to be as wide as the parent. Um, but the important part is that the parent, its default is to align items stretch, which means along the vertical axis, I'm going to stretch the child so that it's only as tall as I am. So in this case, the popover had a fixed height, and it said, OK, my one child, you can't be any taller than me. Be exactly the same size. So now all the extra content disappeared um, because the content area is only the same size. However, if I try and scroll in here, there's no scrolling going on, which isn't exactly what I want. So let's add a couple more little, again, nested flex containers, but really, really simple. The content, I also want to be a flex container. Only this container, I want to orient vertically because the panes are coming one after another vertically. So I'm going to say display flex and flex direction column. And then for my average pane, I'm just going to say you can grow or you can shrink if you have to. If there's not enough space for you, I'm OK with you shrinking. Um, but start at your natural size. And then the fixed popover panes, uh, I don't want them to grow or shrink at all. I want them to always be visible. So I set their flex grow and flex shrink values to 0. Now we can see that if I scroll in here, all of a sudden, this guy, because it shrunk and I added overflow auto, so it's going to be able to scroll, uh, the height of this guy is uh, fixed to the space that was available to it, um, but it scrolls if there's extra content that's needed. And this guy never scrolls off the popover, always stays fixed to the top. And where is this really powerful? Well, the powerful part is that nowhere did we have to hard code a single measurement. We never had to say, how tall is that fixed part? Because I have to add some margin or add some top in order to shove the rest of the content down. I never had to add that. And why is that powerful? Because now I don't have to care about what content is inside of any of those panes. The content can be completely dynamic. It can be completely responsive. It can grow or shrink or we can add more. And this thing will just, because it's all based on relative measurements and the natural size of things, it'll just grow or shrink as it needs to. So let's say that I needed to add some more content to the header. I can add that in. The header grows. The space that's available to this guy shrinks. And since it was allowed to flex shrink, it just shrinks to do that and still overflows. Or maybe I even want to add another fixed pane here. So I want to add something at the bottom as well. Uh, I can do that. Again, it doesn't matter where it was. I didn't hard code to say that the fixed pane had to be at the top. I just said, don't shrink, don't grow. So now I can put one at the bottom as well. And the middle content area, again, it just said, OK, I guess I got to shrink a little bit more. And it shrinks right up and does what it needs to. So really powerful. Again, not a single media query here, not a single fixed measurement at all. That's the, that's the power. Because when you're building dynamic, large, responsive applications, you are going to media query yourself to death. And you are going to absolute position yourself to death with a lot of things. But Flexbox allows you to get around that because it's based on the intrinsic size of the elements and how they should grow or shrink. That one, when I did that one, like I built those popovers, I was like, oh, damn, yes. That's so good. <laughs> Love it so much. OK. Uh, hopefully, I'm not sounding too weird at this point. Uh, wrappable. So we have a lot of these where we have some content besides some other content. Um, and when there's space, we want them to be beside each other, preferably with like a button that's pushed all the way to the right if we can. Um, but if there's not space, we want them to wrap underneath each other. And we still want there to be space between them. So how do we do this? Well, the way that we might naturally think to do it is we figure out what breakpoint we need. We add a media query. In that media query, we change things from like floating to just be display block. And maybe we add some margin top to that button. But that is not a very scalable solution. Because as soon as you use this component in a different context, where there's less width available to it, 
uh, or you don't know what context it's going to be inside, you can't set a single static media query in order to determine what that is. Even if we had element queries or container queries like Snook talked about, uh, we wouldn't be in a much better situation because we don't know how long the text is. Maybe the text is going to be translated for internationalization. Maybe we're going to add another button. We have no idea what we're actually going to be doing here. Um, so media queries or element queries, they don't help us really. We're kind of SOL uh, if we don't have Flexbox. But we do have Flexbox. So let's see how we can do this with Flexbox. This is a module that we use all over the place in Shopify. Uh, it's an incredibly versatile module. Uh, it's called Wrappable. Um, I think I kind of gave the idea to one of my coworkers, but she uh, took it and flew with it, and she did an amazing job. Um, the basic structure is we have a Wrappable, and then inside of that Wrappable, we've got Wrappable items. By default, a wrappable item will stretch to fill whatever space is available. Uh, but we also have a no flex version, which is similar to the fixed popover panes, which will not grow. It will just stay its natural size. Now, the code for this is so small that we could actually just write it, but uh, I'm just going to uncomment it, and we're going to see how it works, and then we'll kind of go over it. So what we have here now is that if there's space, these guys sit beside each other, uh, and there's some spacing between them. If there's no space, not enough space for both of them, then the one goes underneath the other one. And again, there's still space on top. And you can see here, there are no media queries. So it's totally done. Um, with just Flexbox. So how does it work? Uh, the wrappable container, it's going to be display flex, and it's going to be the default of row, because we are orienting these things horizontally. The special part comes in here with the wrap and the negative margins. So flex wrap means that if there's not enough space for all the elements, they will wrap underneath one another. So that's an important part of this, because the module is called wrappable. Um, now, the negative margin. The reason that we have this negative margin is that on the wrappable items, we add a margin right and a margin bottom of the spacing we want between the elements. And we do this regardless of which element we have. And you can see here, we're adding margin bottom even though they might be on a single line. So if they're on a single line, we don't want that margin bottom to actually happen because otherwise we're going to have double the spacing inside of this little card. So what we do is we add negative margin on the container that exactly matches the margin on the elements. And what that does is it says, OK, for the last line of flex, of flex items here, I'm going to take negative the margin that you have. But if there are multiple lines of uh, elements, as there are right now, then the first line, it still has its margin bottom, and nothing is taking it off. And the same thing goes horizontally. Um, even though this thing is pinned right to the edge, it has margin left of one rem. But because the container has negative margin left of one rem, it sits exactly uh, flush with the container, which is what we want. And so now there's the spacing between the button, you resize, and there you go. Uh, super easy. Uh, the module is so tiny. Uh, any of you could add it right now. You can add a couple variations where wrappable items start off as being able to grow or shrink by default, which is what this text area is. Um, but the no flex variation allows them to stay the exact size they are, which is the case for the button. And that's why in this case, when there's lots of space available, the text fills the space that's available because it has a non-zero non flex grow value, and the button just stays exactly where it is because it's not allowed to grow. Super easy. I love this module. It's super, super versatile for responsive layouts. And we can take this a step further. I'm going to probably cut it here. You can go play with this code pen. But basically, using only Flexbox, not a single media query, we can write a layout that has, all, uh, that has a heading next to some actions um, when there's enough space. When there's not enough space, it'll break those actions onto a separate line and put the primary actions on the far right so that they're still emphasized. And when there's not enough space for that, start breaking down the buttons onto separate lines as well. So this layout, not a single media query. 
You can check the code pen. Uh, it's a little bit more involved and it's got some fun stuff going on. Um, but no media queries at all. Completely responsive though. Responsive without the media queries. A couple things. Uh, as with any kind of new tool, uh, it's nice to have something to take with you in order to help you out. Um, the CSS tricks reference to Flexbox is good. It describes all the properties very well. It doesn't describe how you can use them in interesting ways, but hopefully you've gotten a little bit out of that, a little bit of that out of my talk. Um, there's also auto prefixer. So I was doing everything with the final version of the spec, no prefixes at all. Um, that is not what you should do. Do not just like ship something that has no prefixes at all. Um, there have been three versions of the spec, each with different property names for all the different things that I've done. And then there's also vendor prefixing in there. So you do not want to write that by hand. Uh, auto prefixer or prefix free or whatever you use. Uh, if you have a build chain for your CSS or if you use SAS or whatever, you have to compile it anyway. May as well throw auto prefixer in there because Flexbox is nice to write when you don't have to write any vendor prefixes, but when you do, it's kind of painful. Flexbugs, if you are using Flexbox and you find there's some uh, cross-browser issues, uh, that is not, maybe not you. Uh, there are definitely issues with the spec across browsers, especially as I said, IE10 uh, did not do a fabulous job. They got it in at least, just, we should pat them on the back for that. Um, but Flexbo Flexbugs is a GitHub repo that documents tons of um, issues in cross-browser for Flexbox and workarounds if they're available and links to issue trackers in browsers. It's a really fabulous resource. And this one just came across. I imagine a lot of folks saw it. Flexbox Froggy, really cute. It's a little puzzle game where you use the Flexbox properties to try and get the frogs onto the correctly colored lily pads. Um, very cute. I'm glad it came out before I talk. Uh, it's a little contrived, if I'm going to be totally honest. Like, it is using combinations of properties you would never use in real life, um, but it's still a fun thing and you get to use some of these properties and see how they work for you. So that's been me. I'm underscore 11 made on Twitter. Work at Shopify if you want to come work with us. Uh, thank you guys very much. Thank you.